to welcome you to today's uh, joint neuroscience seminars, which will be given by Nicole Peterson. Um, I think you're going to really, really enjoy her talk. Um, but before we get into Nicole's presentation, I'd like to uh, say a few words about the Integrative Center for Neuroscience uh, on Addiction. And uh, this center is uh, what Nicole is going to be representing today. And um, it's um, a program that spans uh, different levels of organization from uh, rodent studies through human studies. The uh, types of investigations range from cellular molecular uh, studies in uh, model systems to uh, neural circuits in animal models as well as humans studied with brain imaging all the way through clinical trials. Uh, it includes uh, divisions and laboratories within the School of Medicine and several departments including psychiatry and pharmacology. Uh, we have a large component from the Division of Life Sciences, uh, the Department of Psychology, and we also have individuals from the School of Dentistry. A lot of what we do uh, focuses on our training program. We have a National Institute on Drug Abuse sponsored T32 training program in the Translational Neuroscience of Addictions with slots for pre-doctoral and post-doctoral fellows. Um, we have an annual retreat, which is a wonderful event because it allows us to see the breadth of, um, the breadth of neuroscience and addiction research at UCLA. That occurs in the spring. And we do have uh, a seminar uh, that will resume in the fall and we have speakers from within the university as well as without. Um, so if you're interested, please uh, get on our mailing list. And before we get to the fall, we have one of our uh, faculty, Dr. Kate Wassum, has organized a Stay Connected uh, postdoctoral virtual seminar series. That's every Friday, it's ongoing now. And I've got the uh, login information and registration information on the screen. Uh, if you're interested and don't have time to copy that down really quickly right now, just go ahead and send a note to um, Kate or me, Kate Wassum or me, uh, and we'll get you on the mailing list. So, I'd like to just say a few words now about Nicole. We're very, very proud of Nicole. Um, she is one of our trainees. She got a bachelor's degree in biopsychology from the State University of New York in Binghamton. In 2013, she got a PhD from the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at the University of California, Irvine. And in 2014, she came to us as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, before she came to us, she had already started doing some really exciting, important work, um, very fundamental on the role of ovarian hormones in influencing uh, brain function and even brain structure. She's continued that work since she's come to us. Uh, she's done work on the menstrual cycle, how it influences brain function, and uh, she did some excellent work with us on the premenstrual uh, dysphoric disorder uh, with respect to neural systems that are dysregulated and how that involves emotion regulation. Uh, most recently, she's been working on um, the problem of tobacco use disorder which kills more people in the United States than COVID. And um, she has been working on studies of sex differences and, and how people respond to uh, behavioral states related to smoking. And she got a K99 award to move to the next phase. 
And in this next phase, she's using uh, trans transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation uh, in a network level approach to understanding um, sex as a biological variable and um, how people react uh, to smoking and abstinence and, um, and uh, perhaps intervention for smoking cessation. So at this, at this time, uh, I'd like to let Nicole take over and give, give you her presentation. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Edie always told me that uh, I don't speak up enough and I need a microphone for presentations. But in this new era of Zoom, I can live without the microphone, I think. So before I start talking about myself, I see that we have a pretty good turnout here. And I'm wondering if I can learn a little bit about who is here. Um, for those of you who haven't used the react buttons before, if you click on participants along the bottom bar, you should be able to see some buttons that'll let you say yes, no, go slower, go faster. Um, can everyone who's found that press the yes button? Okay, so far so good. And you can untoggle it just by pressing it one more time. Um, okay, so how many of you are graduate students? A couple. Okay. How many postdocs? Faculty? Other staff? And if I didn't name you, you can feel free to uh, drop a line in the chat box. How many of you are human neuroimagers? I see we have some of you. Um, okay, so I, there was a version of this talk that had a lot of um, kind of 101 level stuff about brain imaging, and I, I took it out, but I see that the majority of you are not brain imagers, so if at any point you want me to clarify any of the terms that I'm using, please feel free to, um, probably the easiest way to do it by Zoom is, is to put a note in the chat box. Okay, um, then I'm going to try sharing my screen and get on with the science. Okay. Oh, and just kidding. Before I talk about science, I want to talk about one other thing. Um, thanks to the pandemic, I am on my own here with these two lovely young junior investigators. Um, so it may, there may come a time when I need to step away from the screen briefly um, to help them out with something. If I do, sorry, I need my mouse back. Um, if I do, then I will mute my camera and my microphone and I will return as quickly as I can. Okay. Uh, okay, so on to the science. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? All right, uh, so this is a talk that I like to call the effects of sex on the cortex, translational neuroimaging in male and female smokers. So before we talk about smoking, uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic that has affected all of us and cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, and this pandemic may in fact uh, intersect with the problem of smoking in that smoking is a risk factor for negative outcomes in COVID-19 patients. A meta-analysis found that smokers were nearly two and a half times more likely to be admitted to the ICU, to need mechanical ventilation, uh, or to die compared to, oh, sorry, compared to non-smokers. Um, this also intersects with the issue of differences in that men have worse COVID-19 outcomes than women do. These data come from the New York City outbreak and you can see that men are more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19, to be hospitalized with COVID-19, and to die from COVID-19. And this is not isolated to the New York City outbreak. This met, uh, data again from, actually this isn't a meta-analysis, this is from a review article showing case fatality rates across a number of different countries. I think the most striking thing from this that you can see is that the case fatality rates are wildly different between countries. But what you'll see is that even in countries, whether the country has a low case fatality rate or a high one, men tend to have worse COVID-19 outcomes than women do. 
Men are also much more likely to smoke than women are. These data show the ratio of men who smoke versus women who smoke across a number of different countries. The dotted line across the center indicates an equal proportion of men and women who smoke in that country. You'll see that Sweden, as usual, is leading the way in equality. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, in nearly every country in the world, men are more likely to smoke than women are. So it's been speculated that, sorry, it's been speculated that the worst, and I want to clarify, this is not a conclusion, this is a hypothesis, that the worst outcomes, uh, COVID outcomes in men may be related to the fact that men are more likely to smoke. That is, it could be a statistical artifact of the fact that men are more likely to smoke and smoking is, exacerbates um, COVID-19. So although men are much more likely than women to smoke, uh, women are less likely to quit smoking successfully than men are. These data are taken from a meta-analysis where this odds ratio of zero indicates an equal likelihood of quitting, and the long tail out to the left shows that uh, women are less likely to quit smoking successfully than men are. This may be related to differences in pharmacotherapy efficacy. The first-line treatment for many providers is nicotine replacement therapy, first-line treatment for smoking cessation. And these data, again, from another meta-analysis, show that nicotine replacement therapy is more effective for men than it is for women. Uh, on the other hand, varenicline, which is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor agonist, is another smoking cessation therapy, usually not a first-line therapy. And it is thought to be more effective for women than for men. The data show that uh, there are more women who quit successfully using varenicline. Um, but the effect is not sustained after a year. There are equal, uh, equal rates of quitting or, I guess, more relapsing in women. Um, now, again, a hypothesis, not a conclusion. I, I think it's possible that different treatments work for men and women because the symptoms of abstinence are different for men and for women. And it may be that these treatments are addressing different symptoms. For instance, abstinence produces more affective problems for women than it does for men. Uh, and these data are taken from a study that Edie and I did a few years ago now, where we asked participants to rate their negative affect using this simple self-report scale, indicate the extent you feel this way right now on a scale from one to five, and then they see affective words like distressed or hostile or guilty. Hoping none of you are a five on any of those right now. And we saw that across four different testing sessions, women who were abstinent, overnight abstinent from cigarettes, um, and therefore in a state of craving withdrawal, across four different testing sessions, women reported more negative affect than, than men did. And on all four sessions, we found that smoking a cigarette alleviated this negative affect in women and had no effect on affect in men. We tested them four times because this was a study evaluating neural and behavioral responses to reduce nicotine content cigarettes. So the lowest <laughs> study were 0.027 milligrams, which is effectively denicotinized. And the highest nicotine content in the research cigarettes was 0.763 milligrams, uh, which is comparable to a light cigarette. And what you may notice from these data is that all of the cigarettes alleviated negative affect equally well in women, even the cigarettes that had almost no nicotine at all. We saw something similar when we evaluated craving using, again, self-report questions like, if you could smoke freely, would you like a cigarette this minute? And you'll see again, uh, women, if you look at the baseline, uh, the abstinent sessions, they reported more craving uh, than men did. And you'll see that, again, each cigarette alleviated this craving equally well in women. Uh, but in men, there was a, a dose effect that I've highlighted here where the two lowest, uh, the two lower nicotine yields were less effective at alleviating craving compared to the high nicotine, the two higher nicotine yields in men only. You can see an even more clear dose effect when you see the data reporting liking and disliking. This again is just a simple self-report, how much did you like or dislike these cigarettes? And in this study, men liked cigarettes with more nicotine more, and they disliked cigarettes with more nicotine less. Um, and in women, there was, no, there was no dose effect. Again, indicating this general insensitivity to nicotine dose in, in, women, uh, in women that we don't see in men. Um, this finding from our lab was consistent with data from, this was a secondary analysis from a smoking cessation trial that was testing the efficacy of very low nicotine content or VLNC cigarettes as a smoking cessation aid. 
And in this study, uh, very low nicotine contents were used to try to replace conventional cigarettes. Um, and men benefited from the addition of nicotine patch to the very low nicotine content cigarettes. But in women, adding in additional nicotine via the nicotine patch made no difference in their smoking cessation rate. So I think these and other studies emphasize that personalized smoking cessation approaches that consider sex and gender are needed. Two thirds of smokers report wanting to quit and about half will try to quit each year, but fewer than 10% will succeed. So I wanna spend the rest of this talk explaining how brain imaging can help address that problem. I'll start by talking about how brain imaging has already been used to identify therapeutic targets, and then some work that's very close to my heart, how ovarian hormones influence those neural targets. And then finally, our ongoing study implementing translational neuroimaging to help smokers quit. And then a little bit of conversation about uh, how we can move in future directions. So starting with how brain imaging has already been used to identify therapeutic targets for smoking cessation. PET imaging with the beta-2 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor ligand 2FA shows a high density of this receptor in the insula. If you can't eyeball the insula, then I've put an atlas here for you. You can see a lot of overlap between the bright red regions in the PET images and the atlas showing the location of the insula. The insula is important, is thought to be important for integrating internal and external information. And that's something that we'll talk, I think, a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, and one of my favorite little facts about the insula that I learned the first time I put this talk together is that it's Latin for island. And the insula is very important for smokers because insula activity can predict smoking cessation outcome. By that, I mean, if you image insula activity before a smoker tries to quit, there's a difference in the brain activity between the people who then go on to successfully quit versus those who try to quit and then slip or relapse. So one study found that smokers who subsequently slip during their quit attempt have more insula reactivity to smoking cues. And another found that smokers who subsequently quit have less insula activity during an inhibitory control task. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you have not done an inhibitory control task before, and I would like to change that. So remember, we practiced using the yes and no buttons. Um, here, let me see if I can show. Well, maybe not. Okay, well, if you can get to the yes button, which I can't right now while sharing my screen, um, go ahead and, uh, and get your mouse over the yes button you're gonna see a series of images. When you see a new image, double click the yes button as quickly as you can. Double clicking will toggle it on and then off so you're ready for the next trial. And remember, you wanna do this as quickly as you can as soon as you see the image. If the image is a repeat of something that you've already seen, inhibit that response and do not click the yes button. Okay, you ready? And go. Okay, how'd you guys do? Do you feel your insula is waking up? So in, a, in the inhibitory control task that I'm describing here, instead of seeing pictures of my kids and landscapes, research participants saw images of smoking-related cues and neutral cues. And researchers found that there was less insula activity during the inhibitory control trials, specifically on the smoking cue trials. Um, that is, the participants who went on to relapse had lower insula activity when they were trying to inhibit their response to smoking cues compared to those who successfully quit. Resting state functional connectivity uh, studies have also found differences in, uh, in insula connectivity in um, people who quit versus people who, who relapse. Uh, across two studies, lower insula resting state functional connectivity was found in those who slip compared to those who remain abstinent, although the locations of connectivity uh, that the insula was connected to were slightly different between the two studies. Uh, so these studies and many others have shown that the insula is a key player in nicotine addiction. So knowing that, what might happen if you didn't have one? 
we know this from, we know the answer to that from a now famous lesion study finding that two thirds of smokers with insula lesions, quote, quit smoking easily, immediately, without relapse and without persistence of the urge to smoke. So theoretically, just taking out the insula would be an effective smoking cessation therapy, um, but probably not a very ethical one. And so we can turn to instead non-invasive methods like uh, RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can be increase or decrease activity in a target brain region. One problem with stimulating the insula with TMS is that it's not easily accessible. You can see here, this is why I brought out the atlas earlier, it's important to know the location of the insula if you're trying to do TMS on it. The insula is buried underneath this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, so it's difficult, although not impossible, to reach with TMS. But unlike its namesake, the island, the insula is not an island. It's functionally connected to many of the brain regions. And in theory, stimulating regions that are functionally connected to the insula can change activity throughout an entire network, including activity in the insula. The insula is a major hub of a resting state network called the salience network, which you can see here, and I guess that's the right. Um, the salience network is so named because it detects important or salient information about the environment, and it's thought to be uh, used in allocating attentional resources towards salient stimuli. It's speculated that the salience network is an attentional switch, switching attention between the default mode network, which focuses on internal states like craving, and the executive control network, which is important for uh, cognitive control and awareness of the outside world. So this is just kind of a graphical depiction of the salience network switching attentional resources between the executive control network and default mode network. So the thinking here, if we put it all together, is that if we'd like to modulate insula activity to help smokers quit, then stimulating peripheral cortical regions that are in the insula, that are in the salience network that are more easily accessible with TMS could let us modulate insula activity. So that's how brain imaging has already been used to help identify therapeutic targets. And next I wanna talk about how ovarian hormones may influence these and other neural targets. We talked before about differences in resting state functional connectivity between smokers who successfully quit versus those who relapse. And it turns out that in fact, there's an underlying difference between, uh, not just between those who quit and those who relapse, but also between male and female smokers, where female smokers have higher insula to limbic connectivity compared to male smokers. Now, one big problem with interpreting this finding is that in fact, there are sex differences in resting state functional connectivity in uh, not just in smokers, but in everyone and in almost every resting state and actually in every resting state network that's been evaluated in a large data set. And it's possible that sex differences in resting state networks may be influenced by ovarian hormones. Um, ovarian hormones and I guess and, uh, androgenic hormones too represent one of the major biological differences between men and women. So as Edie mentioned in the beginning of the talk, some work I did um, during my PhD looked at how, uh, how resting state functional connectivity changes over the course of the menstrual cycle, which is a time when ovarian hormones change considerably. So here's a diagram showing four, uh, four ovarian hormones that are important for mod uh, modulating the menstrual cycle. Uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone are on the chart because they're very important to the biological function of the menstrual cycle to getting pregnant. Um, but there is no compelling evidence that they have neuroactive functions. So we'll focus instead on estrogen and progesterone, which both are neuroactive and important hormones for modulating brain function. So you'll see over the course of the menstrual cycle, estrogen and progesterone change considerably. At the onset of the cycle, uh, both hormones are, are low. Shortly before ovulation, estrogen peaks, and then it drops back down but remains elevated through the luteal phase. Progesterone, on the other hand, remains stable and low throughout the follicular phase, increases after ovulation until it peaks in the luteal phase, and then drops off again. And then the cycle repeats. 
so during my PhD work, we found that connectivity between the default mode network and the angular gyrus is lower during the luteal phase compared to the follicular phase. So that is lower during the high hormone phase compared to the low hormone phase. And we saw something similar when we looked in the executive control network too, a decrease in connectivity during the luteal high hormone phase compared to the follicular low hormone phase. And we suspected that if, the, if this connectivity is changing under, under normal conditions, when you're having a menstrual cycle, uh, if connectivity is changing, then probably oral contraceptive pills, which interrupt the menstrual cycle, are going to have some kind of impact on, default, on uh, resting state network connectivity. Um, so we tested that hypothesis. Oh, uh, important to smoking, by the way, because 67% of female smokers report using OCPs or oral contraceptive pills at some point in their lives. And in fact, if you look at current smokers, 29% of, of premenopausal female smokers report current use of OCPs, which is not specifically relevant to brain health necessarily, but is an important public health problem because both oral contraceptive pills and smoking increase the risk of thromboembolism. So it's strongly contraindicated, but women are doing it anyway. Um, all the more reason we need to help them quit smoking. So we tested the effect of oral contraceptive pills on resting state functional connectivity and a few other brain measurements in the first and only double-blind placebo-controlled randomized crossover trial imaging the effects of oral contraceptive pills on the brain, um, which I'm very proud of because I was told at one point that it can't be done. <laughs> They'll never let you. So in this study, we had all of our research participants take 18 to 21 days of a specific formulation of oral contraceptive pills containing ethanol, estradiol, and levonorgestrel, um, and, or a placebo. Um, and then each group, after a washout period of one normal menstrual cycle, crossed over to the other arm. So we were able to look within subjects how do oral contraceptive pills change resting state functional connectivity. And remember, when we looked at um, when we looked at menstrual cycle effects, we saw uh, changes in the default mode network uh, with lower connectivity when hormones were high. And here we see something quite different. We see a highly significant increase in default mode network connectivity during the oral contraceptive pill arm of the study. Um, and it was in kind of an unexpected area. Uh, we see increased connectivity between the default mode network and these clusters that you'll see in the box in occipital cortex, which are generally thought of as visual regions. Um, I hated the finding, um, but Edie liked it. She said unanticipated findings can be the most interesting. <laughs> So indeed, we see that oral contraceptive pills, like the menstrual cycle, seem to influence these resting state networks that we also know are important to smoking behavior. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, we see also that oral contraceptive pills seem to influence the response to nicotine replacement. So this was, again, a secondary analysis of an existing study evaluating the effects of uh, nicotine nasal spray on craving in abstinent smokers. Uh, finding that, and I, I've tried to clarify the graph. I think it's a little bit confusing. There are two groups of naturally cycling women and two groups of oral contraceptive pill users. The naturally, there are two groups of each because there's a high progesterone and low progesterone version of each. Mm -hmm. um, so the naturally cycling women were considered a high progesterone or low progesterone based on endogenous uh, progesterone because they were in two different menstrual cycle phases. And the oral contraceptive pill users were considered high or low progesterone because they were either uh, taking a pill with synthetic progesterone in it, or they were during the, uh, the placebo pill week when they were not taking any oral contraceptive pills. But it ends up being a moot distinction because you'll see that regardless of whether their progesterone is high or low, uh, naturally cycling women show no response to the nicotine nasal spray. It has no effect on craving, but oral contraceptive pill users show, uh, again, irrespective of the amount of progesterone in their system, they have um, a decrease in craving as a response to the nicotine nasal spray. Okay. Uh, so that's some evidence showing that ovarian hormones influence neural targets, specifically resting state networks. And now I want to talk about how we can put it all together and translate neuroimaging to, uh, to try to help smokers quit. So reminder that uh, the default mode network, executive control network, and salience network are all interconnected. 
and works from a different lab found that the connectivity between these three networks is weaker uh, when smokers are abstinent, that is when they are in a state of craving and withdrawal. And you can increase the connectivity between these networks as a result of smoking. Uh, the strength of the correlation between the three networks is quantified as uh, the RAI, or the Resource Allocation Index, again, because it's thought that the salience network allocates attentional resources to one network or the other. Um, importantly, the RAI, the change in the RAI correlates with the change in, cra in craving. Uh, that is, the greater the smoking-induced change in RAI, the greater the smoking-induced change in craving. As I said, these are data from a different lab, and we were able to partially replicate them, uh, finding that there was indeed a smoking-induced increase in RAI in women, although we didn't observe it in men. And we saw the expected change in craving, again, in women, but not in men. That is, the more the RAI changed, the, the more uh, craving changed. So we started to wonder if you believe that the RAI represents the neural mechanism that smoking is reducing craving, could we replace the uh, carcinogenic cigarette with a non-invasive therapy like TMS? and use TMS to increase the RAI, thereby decreasing craving. Uh, so just to recap briefly, because I, I think it's a lot of information, uh, the RAI evaluates uh, the relationship between the default mode network, executive control network, and salience network. Um, brain imaging has pointed this out as a potential therapeutic target, and our goal was to use brain stimulation to increase the RAI to decrease craving. Theoretically, increasing the RAI is going to increase attention away from internal states like craving and toward cognitive control systems that would inhibit behaviors that lead to relapse. Um, just a little diagram again. Okay, but that left us with a big problem. You know, how do you increase the RAI? You're looking at a network of networks and each network has multiple brain regions. And in TMS, you're finding one brain region and targeting it and seeing you know, how, how does that change behavior and how does that change brain activity? Um, but this is my favorite kind of problem. It's what I like to call a solvable problem because it's an empirical question. So we decided to identify uh, peripheral cortical targets within each of the three networks and just see what worked. So the target we're using within the default mode network is the posterior parietal cortex. So the target within the executive control network is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And the target within the salience network is the superior frontal gyrus. But since it's an experiment, we also have to have a control region and we're using visual cortex right in the back here, B5 as the control. So to evaluate the efficacy of each of these targets, first, well, this is what we used to do <laughs> before COVID. This is the design uh, that we hope to return to one day. Uh, first, participants come in for a very lengthy intake session when we evaluate their physical and mental health and their safety to undergo an MRI. Uh, and we get as much information as we can about their history of smoking, other drug use. And then we'll have four different sessions. Uh, participants come in overnight abstinent from smoking. We measure their levels of craving, withdrawal, and affect. We also do an MRI to measure resting state functional connectivity before TMS. And then on each of the four sessions, they receive TMS delivered to one of the four targets. And then we repeat the same measurements they did before to measure their ch the change in craving, withdrawal, and affect. And then we get a little bit more data from them when they're done for the day. One thing I want to highlight about the experimental design that I think makes this project especially innovative is this MRI that we take before we're doing the intervention. Because this is what allows us to use personalized stimulation sites. One of the ways that we're able to personalize the stimulation site is when we take that pre-intervention MRI, we get a high resolution structural image. And this allows us to use neuro-navigated TMS. So what you're seeing here is a uh, uh, 3D representation of this participant's brain. It's not a head model of, you know, an aggregate brain of a bunch of people who are scanned and another scanner far away. This is this person's brain. So when we try to position the magnet over their DLPFC, we're actually putting it over that person's DLPFC, not where we think the DLPFC should be based on some other template brain. 
Um, but we didn't invent neuro-navigated TMS. I think we're just implementing it especially well. Uh, one thing that is pretty novel about this study is the use of individualized voxel selection. So by that I mean when we position the magnet over, say, the DLPFC, like you saw in the video a minute ago, or over the PPC, like you see here, you can see that it's a pretty big ROI. So we don't just put the magnet anywhere in that ROI we find the voxel that has the peak connectivity to the rest of the network that we're trying to stimulate. So for instance, here, we selected the PPC as a, a hub within the default low network. So we find the voxel within the PPC that has the highest connectivity to the rest of the default mode network and place the magnet using your navigation exactly over that voxel. And then we measure uh, we measure the effects on behavior using, again, self-report measurements, like uh, measuring psychological withdrawal. We would ask questions like, are you feeling frustrated on a scale from one to seven? And you can see that when we deliver TMS to the visual cortex, to the control region, it does not influence psychological withdrawal. Uh, no change pre to post stimulation. But when we evaluate the effect on the other brain regions, uh, TMS delivered to the other brain regions, we see something quite different. So one thing that I haven't focused on uh, so much in this talk is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This has pretty much been the go-to site for, I mean, really for most TMS. It's the FDA-approved site for treatment of factory depression. And it's actually been surprisingly effective in previous studies evaluating TMS for smoking cessation. Um, so you can see here, there's a decrease in psychological withdrawal from pre to post stimulation. That's, that's a change in the direction that we're hoping. We're alleviating withdrawal using TMS instead of using a cigarette. Um, but I think what's really exciting about this study is that really everything that we know about the insulo is pointing to the salience network as, as the goal. Um, and you can see here from these data that we get a much stronger effect, a much greater relief of psychological withdrawal when we stimulate the superior frontal gyrus, part of the salience network, compared to the, uh, the other brain regions. And you might remember also from the discussion of the RAI that we expected to see uh, that the RAI was really a target for, for female smokers more than male smokers. And you'll see that in fact, the effect that we're seeing in the superior frontal gyrus stimulation sessions is driven almost entirely by the effect in female smokers. It seems to be much more effective for women than it is for men. Um, so I think these data are kind of a proof of concept showing that brain imaging can provide smoking cessation therapy, uh, smoking cessation treatments that are evidence-based and personalized and effective. Um, and just briefly talking about some future directions that we're hoping to go in. Um, we can continue to personalize the target that we use to stimulate, you know, using these methods that I talked about, like neuro-navigated TMS and individualized voxel selection. But I think that this is, uh, that this is almost ready for a clinical trial of imaging-guided TMS for smoking cessation. So what we've done so far is we found a really good target and we see that we can alleviate craving and withdrawal symptoms in a single session, but we don't know if that actually influences smoking behavior. So I think that's, um, that's the next step. But we don't have to stop there. We can also personalize stimulation frequency. So the neuromodulation team at UCLA has pioneered the use of EEG measurements of individual frequency bands to improve TMS treatment for, uh, for depression. Uh, and there's no reason that we can't apply the same thing to addiction and get even better results. And last, I also want to bring in my personal favorite project, uh, looking at how ovarian hormones might influence TMS efficacy. There's a little bit of preliminary data showing that uh, cortical excitability changes over the course of the menstrual cycle. So theoretically, TMS efficacy should change as well, but that's not something that's been evaluated. And I think, I think we're the right team to do it. Um, so in conclusion, um, brain imaging can be used to understand the neurobiological mechanisms of, of addiction. And I hope the other addiction researchers in the audience are seeing that there's no reason that this has to be restricted just to smokers. This is a proof of concept for a pipeline that can be used to tra translate neuroimaging findings for any kind of addiction. Um, but importantly, the mechanisms behind addiction are probably different for men and for women, so the interventions need to be different too. And in both men and women, brain imaging can be translated into personalized medicine approaches to improve public health.
hi, buddy. Um, so <laughs> here, you want to come? In conclusion, I just want to thank everybody who made all of this possible, especially Edie, who's been by my side and supporting me for more than six years now, um, and all of the other investigators who uh, taught me about addiction, about TMS, about brain imaging, importantly, all of the support staff who were the boots on the ground, getting participants through the door and making literally thousands of phone calls <laughs> to get 26 women for that randomized trial. Um, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, my funding, uh, my sources of funding, many thanks to NIDA and to the Friends of Semmel and to the Iris Cancer Group here at UCLA. Um, that is everything that I wanted to tell you guys. Uh, I would be happy to stick around and take some questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can get my mouse back. Anybody? I think there's a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. What does connectivity look like in non-smokers who have never have smoked? Um, it looks like all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it depends on what kind of connectivity and whether they're male or female and where they're in their menstrual cycle and whether they're taking oral contraceptive pills. Um, but I can, I can speak to that more specifically. Is this uh, maybe about the RAI? Yeah, um, so one thing I didn't mention is that the RAI is becoming a bit of a, a controversial measurement. Um, it's thought to maybe not be a great biomarker for substance use disorders. I thought it was important to talk about it because it was part of, um, it, it was part of the history of the project. You know, that's how we landed on these um, these brain stimulation sites, um, but I, it, it looks like there probably is not a unique signature of the RAI in smokers or in any other substance use disorder. The three networks are functionally connected to one another in, in everyone. Uh, another question, was there a control comparison of how the use of OCP affects the efficacy of TMS treatment? I would love to do that study. Um, but no, we haven't, we haven't done that. And in fact, I think the, the first thing that we need to do is establish before you even bring oral contraceptive pills on board, um, how do endogenous sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone affect cortical excitability and TMS efficacy? And that work has not been done. And after we lay that groundwork, then we can look at how oral contraceptive pills will influence TMS efficacy. In relation to the impulse test we did, is there a way to strengthen the insula or develop it? It's a good question. Um, I think for one thing, I, I, you know, I, I try not to go too hard on this because personally, I think some of the insula data is confusing. Do you want a strong insula? Do you want a weak insula? Remember that some of the data I showed showed higher um, insula activity in people who relapsed and some showed, showed lower insula activity in people who relapsed. And then in the lesion study, they took the whole thing out and people did fine. So is the goal to strengthen the insula or, or is the goal to get rid of it entirely? I think you know it's an empirical question. Um, but to answer the question that you're asking, is there a way to strengthen the insula? Um, I mean, for sure you can strengthen, uh, you can strengthen cognitive control, um, but I think probably there are behavioral interventions that are gonna be more accessible and effective than TMS. Uh, if OC increases connectivity and reduces craving, why was TMS applied to areas of high connectivity? Oral contraceptive pills increase connectivity between the default mode network and the rest of, and there, those clusters that I was showing in occipital cortex. Um, we don't know if oral contraceptives increase connectivity in the salience network, which seems to be the important target for, um, for smoking cessation. I kind of had a pet theory that the default mode network might also be important. You know, maybe there's kind of two paths to alleviating craving. Like you can increase control on the salience network or you can decrease uh, 
the the role of the default mode network. It looks like maybe I was wrong about that. Um, but the point is that increasing connectivity in the default mode network doesn't necessarily influence craving. That's a ne the next step that we would have to look at. Um, and also, we don't know that oral contraceptive pills reduce craving. We know that in women who use oral contraceptive pills, a nicotine nasal spray and nicotine replacement therapy is more effective than women who don't use oral contraceptive pills. There have been a few studies looking at how oral contraceptive pills affect smoking cessation. There's one, there's one small one, and the results are mixed. Um, so I don't think that we can say uh, necessarily that oral contraceptive pills are good or bad for craving. Um, why was TMS applied to areas of high connectivity? That was in some ways just uh, for practical purposes. What we wanted to see is a demonstration of target engagement. When we deliver TMS to a hub within the network, um, how does that perturb the whole network's dynamics? And the answer to that question is not something I presented here because I, I haven't analyzed that data yet, but that's the next step. Do you have an idea of a molecular target that may influence the relevant connectivity? Could be glutamate. Um, here I have, maybe, let me see if I can show you guys. Yeah. I'm gonna try to share my screen again. All right, you guys see this? Um, so these are effects of TMS on brain glutamate measured with uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, and I think the panel's looking at, so it's DLPFC stimulation, and then they measured glutamate in DLPFC where they're stimulating, and also ACC, which is functionally connected to DLPFC. Um, I, I think the results are kind of confusing, um, but the bottom line is that you do see changes in glutamate in the DLPFC and also in the ACC as a result of TMS. So yeah, I think glutamate is a, I mean, it's a very likely molecular target for TMS efficacy. Um, who else? My control for TMS was the visual cortex. Does TMS in this area change visual processing? It's possible. We, we had a lot of trouble picking a control region for this study. Um, I wanted to do a sham, but TMS, I didn't realize before I did it, um, TMS is very, you feel it very strongly. So if you use a sham that's like a very low intensity stimulation, that doesn't work. So we had to stimulate somewhere. Um, and I think in some ways we just got lucky that V5 seemed to work as well as it did. Um, we ask our participants, we do kind of like an open-ended debriefing and ask them what, you know, what symptoms or experiences, what symptoms did you feel or experiences did you have? And no one has volunteered visual changes, um, but it's, yeah, it's entirely possible that it causes them. How focused is TMS? How much of outlying regions do you affect? You know, I was worried I was going to get that question, so I just reread this paper where they use electric field mapping, um, and the answer to that is known, but I don't have it on the top of my head. Um, it's more focal than you might expect, but it also depends a lot on the stimulation parameters that you use and the shape and type of stimulating coil. Um, and I think the question of how much of outlying regions do you affect, there's kind of two answers to that, right? There's first the stimulation itself, you know, how much of the neighborhood of where you're stimulating gets affected. And the answer to that is, you know, some, and it depends a lot on who the person is and again, what the stimulation parameters are. But there's also the issue of everything that's functionally connected to the area that you're stimulating appears to also be influenced by that. So, so really, no matter how focal the stimulation is you could be having kind of downstream effects throughout the brain. Could the decrease in craving due to OC also be confounded because subjects taking them might be more conscious or concerned of how the effects of smoking might affect efficacy of OCP? That's an interesting question. Um, I want to clarify again that we didn't see that oral contraceptives themselves have any influence on craving. All we saw was that women who 
are taking oral contraceptives do better when we give them a, a nicotine replacement or nicotine use spray. Um, but yeah, one of the big challenges of human studies research is that, um, you know, people have, they have their own thoughts and feelings and behaviors and we, we don't get to control those. It's, it's a very open system. So uh, that's one of the reasons I think it's really important to do crossover studies like the one I described because there's a big difference between women who take oral contraceptives. There, there are not a big difference. There seem to be underlying population differences between women who take oral contraceptive pills and women who never do. And even between women who take oral contraceptive pills and stay on them long enough to go in your study compared to women who take oral contraceptive pills and hate them and immediately discontinue. Um, so uh, no, no answer to your question, but a lot of studies yet to be done. Um, yes, you can contact me. We're not, uh, we're not doing any research right now because um, I don't want to get COVID and leave my children motherless. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in, for future research opportunities, you can send me an email. Um, more experimental methods to try to directly target an inner region, like with transcranial focused ultrasound as opposed to TMS. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things that I was really excited to try when we, um, when we had to shut everything down in March is we were talking to some collaborators about um, uh, ultrasound as a possibility. There are also, I mean, for, for experimental, uh, like deep, TMS stimulation. There, there are experimental coils that'll let you go very deep, but that actually goes back to the question about focality. Um, you, can, you can change the shape of the coil to get deeper stimulation, to get directly to the insula, but then you're also stimulating everything on top of it and uh, it becomes a very diffuse stimulation. Um, I think ultrasound is a great way of getting around that problem. Um, and one of the things that I think would be really cool to do, and one of the only places you can do it is at UCLA, would be a direct head-to-head -head comparison of TMS versus um, a focused ultrasound. Can you predict gender from looking at the brain recording data that you collect for each of the scenarios that you evaluated? Um, I can't. <laughs> there have been some great studies using very large data sets and machine learning to um, to predict to you know to predict the the biological sex of the person whose brain is being imaged, but the data sets that I'm dealing with here are not definitely not big enough to to do that. Any other questions? Do you think that the role of ovarian hormones in addiction changes depending on the stage of the addiction cycle, e.g., initial drug use versus compulsive drug use? Man, I love that question. Um, it's an empirical question. <laughs> One of the things that's been challenging is that there has been an interest in how ovarian hormones influence addiction, and many studies have been done, and there is no consensus. You know, you can't say, if you want to quit smoking, do it in the follicular phase, because some studies show the follicular phase is better, and some show the luteal phase is better, and some show no difference. And my thinking up until now has always been that, you know, probably I think researchers have been constrained by, you know, by just the logistics of you don't get to set someone's menstrual cycle. You have to just follow it and see what you get. Um, and it changes so much between subjects. It changes so much within a specific subject that it's very hard to get clean, conclusive data. So my thinking had been that all of the ambiguity about the role of the menstrual cycle in addiction had to do with these methodological problems. But I actually think you're onto a great thing that maybe the reason that we don't have a clear idea about how the menstrual cycle affects addiction is because maybe it has a completely different role. Maybe some, you know, maybe estrogen facilitates the initiation of drug use, but also facilitates quitting. And that's why, you know, it's so hard to say like, is estrogen good for addiction or bad? No one knows. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great question and definitely an area to be explored. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, oh, um, here, I'm going to drop my email address in the chat box. Um, if you guys do have any other questions uh, or interested in research opportunities, feel free to 
send me an email. I am so delighted to see that there's so much interest in neuroendocrinology at UCLA. Um, and I'm happy to talk to any of you more about it. Um, thank you so much for <laughs> coming to my talk. It's really nice to hear all your questions and see all your faces. And I hope the rest of your pandemic is as pleasant as possible. <laughs> thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.